thank you for pointing my attention. <laughs> we will now start the session as recorded. Um, speakers from this session um, include from Camera Gale land um, and indeed everywhere across Australia you exist on Indigenous Australian land, the sovereignty of which was never ceded. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and um, I like to um, pay a tribute to the ancient and continuing role of that um, Indigenous people have with knowing in this country. Um, so uh, we've got uh, four um speakers uh today um whose talks are all um you know sort of uh, loosely joined around um the issue of uh, material and social practices in science um and our first speaker see i'm really falling apart um in my chairing duties because i haven't even got the um speaking order up in front of me uh, our First speaker, um, uh, of course, is uh, is Angelique Hutchison. Is um, uh, Angelique? <laughs> Hi, uh, Martin. Hi, I'm having some technical issues today, um, so I'm wondering if you would be able to share my presentation. Um, I can certainly do that. Um, that would so, be great. Um, so. I, um, it's a particular pleasure for me to um, introduce uh, Angelique because um, I worked with uh, Angelique years ago at the um, at Museums Victoria um, and uh, these days uh, Angelique is a curator at the Powerhouse Museum um, in Sydney, uh, role to research contemporary and historical areas of science, technology and industry and to build the museum's collection in these fields um, and share the collection and research with the public. Uh, Angelique's love of science uh, formed during her engineering studies when her ra research ranged from optimising the operation of industrial coke furnaces to creating delicate electronic muscles in the lab. Um, and as a science communicator and educator with Questacon in the powerhouse, she has shared a love of technology with remote and regional communities and urban um, audiences. Um, I will... Um, go to PowerPoint and I will need to obviously uh, open up the presentation, which I should have had ready to go. Uh, and obviously, uh, Angelique, you'll um, yell out when you need uh, transitions, but I am ready to Share that now. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. And thanks for having me, everyone. It's really, um, really excited to be here talking with you today. I'm presenting from the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation. And I just wanted to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the ancestral homelands upon which the museums that I work in are situated and pay respect to their elders past, present and future and recognise their continuing connection to country. Today, I wanted to share with you how the collecting at the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, or the Powerhouse Museum as it's widely known, has documented the many different dimensions of the climate crisis, from technological advancements of the first industrial revolution through to contemporary human responses. And by reviewing a selection of objects from the museum's collecting, we can see many different ways that science, technology, culture, and nature intersect along the histories of climate change. So next slide, please, Mun. So to begin with, we will look at the origins of the Powerhouse Museum and perhaps even earlier. Um, as <laughs> as um, sorry, I just had a technical issue. As it was established in an attempt to emulate the colonial institutions of Europe, um, such as the South Kensington Museum, uh, a Natural History Museum, and Science Museum in London. And like these institutions, which grew out of the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. Uh, the first collections at the Powerhouse emerged from the Sydney International Exhibition in 1879 with a focus on industry and manufacturing, colonial advancement and products of the Industrial Revolution. Our next slide, please, Martin. So at this point, I want to note that due to the collecting practices in the early years of the museum, the representation of First Nations people and their relationships with the Australian environment in the museum's collection is minimal. 
ethnographic material and natural science collections that remained from the Sydney International Exhibition were largely transferred to what is now known as the Australian Museum. Uh, the powerhouse collection does include some stone tools such as this grindstone and mill, which speaks to first Australians uh, cultivation and use of grain. But as was the practice at the time, the information about the makers or users of these items were not recorded when they were collected. The museum now has a growing team of people researching First Nations items in our collection uh, to better understand and document their stories and provenance. And because this work is ongoing, I'll, I won't elaborate any further on these First Nations collections, but I'll look forward to sharing some of that research with you into the future. So next slide, please, Martin. So the first museum halls were established in the Garden Palace in Sydney's Botanical Gardens following the Sydney International Exhibition of 1879. And the museum's statement of purpose in 1880 was to collect together typical collections of all materials of economic value belonging to the animal, vegetable and the mineral kingdoms from the raw material through to the various stages of manufacture to the final product or finished article ready for use. This included timber samples, botanical specimens, mineral specimens, wool, silk, almost every material with industrial use available at the time. And the commercial products of these materials were also included, such as ceramics and metalware. Following the, the, the destruction of the Garden Palace and most of the museum's collections by fire in 1882, the curator at the time, Joseph Henry Maiden, sought to rebuild the collections by sourcing the latest in manufactured goods and commercial products of the time. The museum reopened in the nearby agricultural hall in the domain, which you can see here. And from these very early days, the museum's collections were seen as a resource for learning about the natural world and harnessing it for economic benefit. Next slide, please, Martin. Uh, the, the move to the Technological Museum in Ultimo in 1893, alongside the Sydney Technological College, further cemented relationships between collections and te technical education. With the ambition to explain the science of everyday life to the common worker, the museum promoted itself as a Bureau of Information to which the public can appeal to at any time concerning matters relating to the natural resources of the colony. The halls were arranged according to the animal, vegetable and mineral kingdoms, displaying everything from raw materials through to the most advanced machinery or decorative arts of the time. And it was here that the museum's research program relating to botanical oils and in particular eucalyptus began with the installation of a distillery and research labs. So this gives you some context to the formation of the museum and its early collections. Next slide, please. In 1988, the museum moved into the building in which we're currently situated, uh, a former power station. It looks a bit different to this now, but it was a power station that generated electricity using coal that powered the tram network that operated in Sydney. Of course, this former life of the building is the origin of the museum's name and has provided direction to the content of the exhibitions relating to energy and transport and associated collecting. This building, the Powerhouse Museum, now houses some of the building, the museum's most iconic objects, which were, acqu were acquired in the formative years of the museum and represent some of the biggest challenges we now face relating to climate change, and that is energy and transport. Next slide, please, Martin. So we have the Bolton and Watt engine here on the left, built in 1785. It came into the museum's collection in 1888 and is the oldest rotative steam engine in the world. Innovations in the design made it a more efficient and economical engine, but it was the partnership of Matthew Bolton and James Watt that made rotative engines like this one, the first commercially successful stationary power plants that were independent of wind and water and horsepower. This engine joined the collection and was later exhibited as an example of the success of industrialization. But as others have indicated, the birth of the steam engine with James Watt has been suggested as the beginning of the Anthropocene. So while this engine and others like it enabled the industrial revolution to take place and represent the success of this great period of change, this engine also represents the many challenges we still grapple with around shifts in use of resources, use of fossil fuels and impacts on the environment. Another of the iconic objects that you see as soon as you walk into the building is locomotive number one on the right. 
Built in the UK in 1854, it hauled the first passenger train in New South Wales from Sydney to Parramatta in 1855. This was the culmination of decades of lobbying by industrialists and it was uh, part of the planning for the railway to the state's interior. It was the beginning of expansion of railways across New South Wales. By the 1880s, the railways had spread across the state and became a vital link between the country and the city, transporting wool, grain and coal. They fostered the development of primary industries and transported products to market. People could travel to see friends and family and communities that were on the train route prospered. So this object was acquired into the museum's collection in 1884 as an example of engineering achievement and as a record of the great impact that the railways had on people and communities. It represents the opening up of the state for settlement, trade and agriculture, but this expansion has also brought with it exploitation of the natural environment, removal of land from First Nations people and the beginning of transport networks powered by fossil fuels. So looking at some of this early collecting, coupled with the museum's existing location, we can see that the museum is closely entangled with the histories of climate change. The museum's collecting throughout the 19th century celebrated the role of science and technology in economic progress. Lawrence Hargrove's studies of flight, Penfold's collecting of plastics, engine models, aircraft engines, wool and more. Economic botany research continued at the museum until the 1970s. But as uh, so social, scientific and cultural discourse has evolved, so has curatorial practice. Curatorial policies at the museum and frameworks began to include the concepts of sustainability and global warming, as it was once known, as they became part of the public discourse. Around 30 years ago, the 1991 collecting priorities included renewable energy, uh, efficiency, recycling, waste, environmental management and the environmental movement. From the 1990s, collecting uh, included products and technologies that contribute to more sustainable practices across a range of areas from design, materials, energy, water, transport, communication and social history. Australian innovation really became a focus at this time too. I'll take you through now some examples of this more recent collecting in relation to climate and sustainability. Next slide, please, Martin. So the museum continued to collect the latest in science and technology. And in this area of um, energy and climate, the Australian developments in solar cell technology has been acquired by the museum. The monocrystalline solar cells on the left are made by Martin Green and Stuart Wenham and the team at University of New South Wales in 1987, were the first to have their contacts buried below the surface, leaving more area um, to capture energy from the sun and increase in efficiency. The work of this team continued to evolve and be commercialised. In 2009, SunTech solar cells in the centre became the most efficient solar cells in mass, mass production. This technology was developed by the team at UNSW and commercialised by one of their alumni in China. The spectrum splitting cell on the right is a more recent development, uh, an improvement on the design of the solar module to improve efficiency. So while the museum has collected these uh, highly scientific responses to climate and energy, there's more domestic examples too. Next slide, please, Martin. On the right, we hold uh, this solar hot water heater from 2001, the Solar Heart. And this was developed it, sort of uh, following on from research at the CSIRO and became a very efficient method of heating hot water for the home and became widely used uh, in Australia and also around the world. On the right, uh, the fluorescent light globe, a very humble object, but uh, also part of our collection. And this, um, this uh, a light globe and many like it were introduced into Australian homes in the 2000s, really in response to um, government restrictions and regulations on the import and use of incandescent light globes. And so government grants supported the rollout of these light globes into homes and that made a very big impact on um, energy use in the home. So there's some technological responses relating to energy. Uh, other areas of interest have included water, resources and transport. Next slide, please. This lovely object, the Deathridge wheel, is based on a design from 1910. 
and it was used on a farm near Griffith in the Murrumbidgee irrigation area to measure the amount of water flowing past it in a channel. So this wheel made it possible to measure how much water was flowing into an individual farm. As settlement grew along the rivers in New South Wales, this method allowed limited amount of water from the rivers to be shared between irrigators. This technology has now largely been replaced by electronic metering, which while more technologically advanced, has not resolved issues of access and water rights in our river systems, which continue to be an ongoing political and social discussion. Next slide, please. In the realm of materials and resources, this furnace uh, was used by the Centre for Sustainable Materials and Technology at the University of New South Wales. This centre is led by Professor Vina Sashwala and this furnace was used to conduct research for the Green Steel Project, which demonstrated how rubber from old car tyres could be used uh, to substitute for coke or carbon in the steel making process. So this improved the amount of steel produced, reduced carbon emissions and maintained the quality of the steel. And this uh, project has gone on to become commercial. Next slide, please. In the realm of transport, collecting the museum has continued to collect uh, beyond the, the um, locomotive. Uh, this vehicle is the Honda Insight, which was the first petrol electric hybrid car to be sold in America and it won many awards. In 2001, it was released into Australia. And this vehicle in our collection is actually the first hybrid vehicle to arrive in Australia in 2001. And it really documents um, the, the transition, I guess a critical part in the transition from petrol powered vehicles through to electric vehicles and the acceleration that's happening at the moment uh, in decarbonising our transport systems. So in addition to these technological responses to climate and sustainability, the museum also collects social and cultural representations. Some of the most interesting are those relating to community activism and protest. Next slide, please. So this Kelly's Bush handmade stand on the right is a protest banner in an unusual form. Kelly's Bush was the last remaining area of natural bush on the upper reaches of the Parramatta River in Hunters Hill and it was scheduled for housing development when a group of local women approached the Builders Labourers Federation in 1971. This kind of collaboration between the union movement and local citizens was a new approach in the environmental movement and the result was a black ban which then became the first of the union's green bans and the first time in the world that this had happened. And this movement saved very much of Sydney's natural and built heritage. On the right, the Greedozer costume worn by Benny Zabel at a wide range of environmental and peace protests from, the 19, from 1980. Um, and Benny Zabel is a political activist and a performance artist and he's been involved in protests uh, since the 1970s. But one significant one that he was involved in was um, the fight to stop the damming of Tasmania's Franklin River. And this environmental issue became an election issue, uh, saw the formation of the first Green Party and represents a period of great change in Australia's um, social and political and environmental sphere. Next slide, please. More recently, the museum has collected a range of placards and posters from the Student Strike for Climate in Sydney in September 2019. These were handmade by students and young people and these artefacts document their stories, but also the climate protests in Australia and globally, which have become one of the most significant social movements in this period of time. The most recent collecting policy in the museum uh, in, continues to include interest in innovation and production, but it also extends to include ideas of disruption, resilience and identity as a platform for debate and dialogue. Climate and sustainability are represented across all areas of the collection and all disciplines, and sometimes in ways that are unexpected. Next slide, please. A Citizen Wolf on the left uh, is a contemporary Australian clothing brand that is seeking to make a positive impact, and it's part of a growing trend you might have noticed towards clothing that is ethically and environmentally responsible. So this company cut and make their garments on demand, they've audited their carbon dioxide emissions and attempt to make each garment, garment uh, carbon neutral. And this recent acquisition is part of the work that our curators of fashion and textiles have been doing 
looking very closely at the environmental claims in the fashion industry. On the right, Peter Drew uh, and this poster, Nature Laughs Last. It's a very sombre response to the personal circumstances of the artist at the time, but is also a response to the extreme bushfires of 2019 and 2020 in Australia. And it expresses the fear and grief after the massive loss of bushland and wildlife and human life. And the artist said that, I wanted to make the viewer feel personally threatened by a force that was omnipotent, but also different. I wanted to address the inherent hubris in our supposed separation from and contest with nature. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, this recent acquisition into the collection is a memorial gravestone and urn. It's called End Cycle. This gravestone is made from discarded fabric, which has been repurposed and transformed by the Centre for Sustainable Materials Research and Technology at the University of New South Wales. The concept of this product is that it could be made from the garments and possessions of the person who has died. And it could potentially include a NFC chip to allow stories of the person to live on. So by reducing consumption at the end of our lives, the idea is that N-Cycle could potentially provide an environmental service. This object explores the concept of death, the accumulation of possessions, and the implications for those left behind. This work was actually commissioned by the powerhouse for display in an exhibition called Hybrid Objects for Future Homes that was held in 2020 and 21. The powerhouse commissioned nine design studios to create objects for the future and asked them to respond to climate data and demographic project predictions for the year 2030. The design studios collaborated with researchers and practitioners from diverse industries. By commissioning works in this way, the museum is participating in the creation of objects for the collection. It's bringing together scientists, artists and designers to stimulate dialogue and discussion across disciplines and to hopefully address some of the challenges of climate and sustainability. Next slide, please, Martin. So hopefully you can see that the museum's collecting has documented many different dimensions of the climate crisis from technological advances uh, to more contemporary human uh, responses. Objects in the collection embody the stories and values of the people and cultures in which they were created and used, and the curatorial values of the time. With time and context, these objects and their meanings change, and as social and cultural dialogues relating to climate have evolved, so have curatorial approaches. Collecting policies have transformed from celebrating the impact of industrialization to a critical engagement with the effects of economic progress. This brief overview has illustrated how some of the Malik Museum's collection is recording the many different expressions of the climate crisis. And the museum's collection continues to evolve uh, as a material record of human ingenuity and as a resource for deeper understandings. Next slide, please. Thanks for having me everyone and I hope to see you all in person soon. Thanks very much. If you'll uh, join me in thanking however you can, uh, once Luke, for a great presentation um, on the practice. And um, uh, thank you for, Anjali, especially for doing that so smoothly with the, <laughs> with the gremlins at your end as well as mine. Um, uh, we've got a good amount of time for questions and comments. Uh, does anyone want to jump off? Ellen? Um, I was just wondering how you identify items, so more the household items that you have in your collection. Do they become apparent as they emerge or is there a period of time usually before you think this might be a worthy item? Yeah, it's a, it's, it, it ranges depending on, I guess, the circumstance. So some of those examples I showed you uh, came from an exhibition that we did, uh, it was about 20 years ago now. Um, so very often collecting is driven by exhibition. So at that time, we were doing an exhibition about the latest in sustainability and how people could, um, you know, change their practices or adopt different kinds of behaviour or different types of technologies. So that was really capturing what was existing at the time and what was the, 
you know, the latest and that the particular um, that particular moment in time. So it can be driven by exhibition needs, but then also we're constantly sort of trying to monitor what's happening, what's going coming next, um, and actively trying to go and seek examples if they uh, exist, um, uh, and you know, bring them into the collection if it's a significant change. Um, and then the other way that we do it is uh, people come to us and. Um, uh, for example, a company just came to me to offer me an object that they were getting rid of that was, you know, they don't need anymore. That's quite significant in terms of um, sustainability and transport. So those opportunities come up, um, you know, normally it's some time after, um, you know, it's been of interest, but still they find their way into our collection that way. Yes, yeah, good. Much feared uh, rescue collecting. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to say that I love the Powerhouse Museum. I think I probably became a mechanical engineer because of it. My father oh. used to take me there as a kid when it was up the street in Harris Street. Uh, I have a question about, it's about the principle of sustainability because mm, I, from my reading, sustainability fundamentally isn't sustainable, that we need to be doing things to reverse what we've done in the past. In other words, we need to do things to reduce uh, carbon dioxide, the, the content of the, of the carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. I'm just wondering if anything that you're collecting is in that area? I'm trying to think now in terms of reducing carbon. Do you mean- Well, not just that, but in, you know, so we're, we're taking minerals out of the ground. And so we're, I mean, that's not a fundamentally not a sustainable process because we're depleting something. So it's a question of what are we doing? I mean, I don't know the answer to this. It's, I've only just come across it myself. Um, so I guess we're looking at all different ways that people are approaching sustainability. So um, materials, recycling materials, we're, we're acquiring examples of objects that are made using recycled materials. So that's, I guess, an example um, of the resource use that you're talking about. Um, just acquired an electric car uh, and also another um, a hybrid or hydrogen vehicle as well that's on the agenda. So there's sort of examples there of transport and that includes the battery technologies, which are, you know, a big interest now. Um, so that's a couple of examples. It, it's ongoing, I guess, as technology evolves, we look and uh, acquire the things that uh, I guess are the most significant um, that we can make an assessment of at the time. It's not always obvious mm. also. Um, yeah. Okay, if we got um, any further questions or comments? I'd like, um, there's definitely a few things there I'm interested in following up with you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Um, in that case, uh, we will move on um, to our next speaker, um, and that's Ian Wills. And um, Ian's already given a, a brief introduction to his uh, career in engineering, and um, Ian turned to the history and philosophy of science after um, this uh, engineering time. His PhD dissertation focused on the history and philosophy of technology using Thomas Edison's laboratory notebooks to understand the processes by which novel artifacts are created. He's recently published on uh, this as Thomas Edison's success and innovation through failure. Uh, his current research focuses on the history of technology in the early 20th century in Australian context. Uh, this research includes the development of manufacturing industries in Australia and Australia's efforts to develop nuclear weapons. So can you all uh, join me in making Ian Wills uh, welcome to present on the Amalgamated Printing Trades Union Review. Hey, thank you. Now I'm having a bit of a weird problem with my earphones, so I'll just, just take them off and hope that that cures the problem. Can you hear me? It's like yes, okay. we can hear you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. Okay. So uh, the amalgamated printing trade union review. Uh, 
and I kind of stumbled on this and you know, as you do with um, primary sources thought oh this is kind of a fascinating thing um, okay so the review was published between 1922 and 1966 by the Amalgamated Printing Trades Union of New South Wales originally. Um, and it was a union newspaper of, uh, if you think of an A3 A sheet folded in half, four pages, and you being printers, they, they pack the words in. So you get about 6,000 words on one of these. Uh, it continued in this format for around 20 years and then became somewhat, um, somewhat larger. So there's about uh, over 500 issues and several million words. And fortunately, the whole set is preserved in, at the ANU in the, sorry, I forgot the name of the collection. Anyway, so the motto of the union was the art preservative of the arts uh, and appeared on the, on the masthead of the union and appeared on their uh, union banner. The irony of it is, although it might have been the art to preserve the arts, the art of printing itself uh, hasn't been well preserved and the lives of printers not well preserved. So what I'm attempting to do today is just capture a little bit of what the concerns of printers were in the early 20th century, what their concerns were and uh, the way the union approached, the, approached it. So a bit of background. Um, so it's Gutenberg's original printing press from roughly uh, 1440. By the middle of the 19th century, uh, printing presses were being built of cast iron, but fundamentally it's the same process. So just going back to Angelique's think this this is printing using human muscle um, the typesetting is done by hand uh, it's not a very fast process typeset at about 20 words a minute printing at about 200 pages an hour but by the end of the 19th century there's been an industrial revolution in printing and printing has suddenly become a mechanized process there's um, typesetting is done by in hot metal so in other words the the, the, the letters are ty typed out on the typewriter, this keyboard here, uh, molten metal is poured onto them and um, the sort of the old process of one letter at a time has been uh, bypassed. Uh, newspapers have been printed because of, of improvements in um, the manufacturing paper, uh, newspapers can be printed continuously. And so we've had an absolute revolution in Printing. So this is uh, the numbers of newspapers papers in Australia around about 1860. There's a, an explosion in uh, newspapers peaking during the First World War. And the thing is that at the time, printing was the mass medium. There was no other. And so if you wanted entertainment, if you wanted news, if you wanted advertising and so on, it was printed. Uh, following the First World War, there's a decline. There's some weird thing about this data that I've got here that causes a collapse there. But I don't, anyway, newspapers have, have declined, but perhaps not at the rate that that appears to make it appear. Uh, make it appear. So, all this revolution in printing produces uh, new skills, new crafts. They produce new craft unions lots of them, lots of small craft unions. And uh, roughly during the First World War, the trades hall decrees that there should be one industry and one union, not a multitude of craft unions. Unfortunately, the First World War also coincides with the dispute over conscription, which splits the Labor Party and the union movement. Uh, there is an attempt to form, as they say, one big union of printers which is the Printing Industry Employees Union, or PIU. Uh, it's founded in uh, 1916. Uh, it's anti-conscription, we'll say moderate prefers negotiation over strike. And uh, although it's nominally a national union, it's largely a union based in Victoria. The dissenters, 
uh, both in terms of conscription and printing industry employees union, form another union, the Amalgamated Printing Trades Union, based in New South Wales, uh, an amalgamation of a number of small specialist unions who are concerned that if they were part of the PIU, they would be swamped because the PIU is dominated by compositors, who are the guys that do the, uh, the typesetting. It is radical and it is left wing. Uh, and it does become a national union in 1947, and what spoiler, the two unions merge in 1966. So the, the uh, uh, masthead of the union, I think, kind of gives you a sense of what is going on. It, it is aspirational, so it's full of these um, optimistic mottos, organised labour is the hope of the world, the past is other people's, the future is ours. Uh, there's that little, the art preservative, the arts motto. And I discovered there is a book here called Alphabets Old and New, which was published in about 1910. Why that book is there, I'm not sure, because it's the only one I can make out. But I think it's a reminder that something like this, despite all that mechanism, is actually produced by hand. There's no desktop publishing. Somebody would have hand drawn all those letters. So the view, uh, as I said, there's uh, about four and a half thousand articles in the review. Uh, it covers a huge range of topics. Um, I'm going to talk about the ones that I've highlighted here. There's political issues, there's world events, there's obviously union news, there's union picnic days, six hour day marches, um, socialism, uh, equal pay, employment and awards. Um, most of the articles in the review are unsigned. There's, there are only three editors in the 44 years of the review and there's an editorial board, but most of the editor, editorial is unsigned too. So it's pretty hard to know who is doing what in the review. However, I have been through some of these and some of the things, frankly, were rather shocking. Virtually every issue has accounts of industrial accidents. A typical one is this one in the middle here. We repeat, re regret to report that a serious mishap occurred to Charles Jordan, LP with letterpress operator, a machinist operated, uh, employed at Jay Field & Co, where he lost his right arm in a two color mailing machine the sufferer is in the ward at night at Sydney Hospital and is lost to know how the mishap occurred. It kind of gives you a sense of the, of the, the articles in the review there. So this man is presumably known to other people so they can go and visit him. It's sort of personal, uh, but I have to say, sadly, not uncommon. And so there, there are some of these other articles are about uh, people well, this man's lost his arm. There's people who've had their fingers cut off in guillotines, hands crushed. Um, the molten metal that's used for typesetting causes burns. There's acid spills because acid is used in, in etching plates. And then there's a whole host of, of um, health hazards like uh, bronze dust, which is used for producing uh, imitation gold print, um, nitrous acid, aniline, high octane petrol over here is is dangerous because it's got lead in it. Um, there's lead in the in the type metal, lead and antimony, both of which are toxic. It's a surprisingly dangerous um, industry. There is no really no effective guarding of the machines. Well, there are, there are guards. They people have to remove them, operate the machine, uh, expose belts, um, and even things like provision of safety footwear doesn't come in as in, in strike air to the telegraph in the 1960s over the provision of safety boots. So the next topic is the question of women in the printing industry. Now the PIEU um, accepted women in 2017, that in other words, a year after that was formed, 
when they amalgamated with a women's only union. And the early issues of their journal, this is the, <laughs> the opposition newspaper, printing trades journal, has a column called the Women's and Girls Correspondence Circle, which in the typical issue I've got here, uh, discusses things like disputes that concern women, um, the union picnic day, wages and cost of living, and uh, a report of the working conditions of women in factories in New York. The P APTU, uh, well, the question is what women? Um, the answer is that women weren't admitted until 1944. Um, in 1935, the union attempted to uh, get the um, arbitration court to prohibit employers from allowing females to operate, set up or run any electronic graphic machine. Women were allowed to put the paper into one end of the machine and take it out the other, but not to operate the machine. In 1942, so this is during the Second World War when there's labour shortages, Male labour shortages, that is. Women's were, women were uh, entered the printing interest industry, um, but uh, the union objected to allowing female labour to do male's work, mainly because of uh, because they were being paid less, and I think significantly less. However, in 1944, I think the the result of uh, pressure is that women are finally paid at a rate of 90% of the male rate. And so the union decided to accept female membership and continues to agitate between 1944 and the end of the review uh, for equal pay. But there are no women union officials. There's no separate coverage in the, U the review as there was in the PIEU uh, newspaper. There's no mention of women apprentices. But at least one win, there's no women in any of the accident reports. And in fact, this photograph here is the only photograph I could find in 44 years of a woman doing work in the printing industry. That's 44 years of this, of this newspaper. The thing which I got from the review is that it's, it's quite aspirational. Um, it, the... The editorial tone is that uh, printers will improve themselves. And so there, there is, as I say, intellectual aspirations in the review. Uh, it supports technical education quite vigorously, especially Sydney Technical College next to the Technological Museum. Uh, there's a lot of articles about the training of, of um, apprentices. Universities, on the other hand, are seen as being producing uh, people who will serve capitalists. And you can see uh, down the bottom here, it says uh, the boss the boss to his university person, we can't have this fellow thinking for himself, and the, the fellow is the, is the printer. And of course, printers are, of necessity, readers. Uh, the union actually is an accrediting body for uh, trade skills. So in other words, you go to the union, the union says, you're qualified uh, printer of a certain kind issues you with this okay card which says that you're qualified and also that you're a financial member of the union which you then take the employer and use that to get a job initially uh, the union supports the, the workers educational association of the WEA but the WEA goes off in a different direction um, it doesn't uh, promote um, issues that uh, the union believes the working classes should learn about. Uh, I mean, today, the WEA, there would be very few workers attending the WEA, I could, can put it that way. Uh, the review, as well as uh, all those other articles about union matters and things, does have um, a series of articles, for example, on uh, book binding, another one on, on uh, Illustration. There's a series of articles which are what finishes up in these uh, these little booklets on socialist education. So when it says education and science, it means a uh, socialist version of science or scientific Marxism, I guess. Uh, and it also uh, includes some 
technical advice and things like that, I sometimes get the impression that some of the technical advice is just to fill up space. So anyway, it publishes these a couple of books, this one and the next one, Robbery Under Laws. Robbery Under Laws is a sort of a critique of the legal system. The union is undoubtedly socialist and the foreword to the, the first edition lays out their objective. It says, our little paper will be a necessary corrective against the misrepresentation of the capitalist controlled press, which of course its members are printing. Uh, there are little hints of socialist values scattered through it. There's a, uh, an item in 1939, the union makes a gift to the support of six orphan children uh, because their mother has committed suicide after uh, they've been evicted and her husband is unemployed. The union solution to this is such awful conditions as these, whatever the things that brought the woman to, the suicide, to suicide, must continue until the great union, trade union movement succeeds in socialising industry, in other words, in nationalising or public ownership of industry. However, the union's policy is what it describes as democratic socialism, simply the attainment of socialist objectives by constitutional democratic means. So despite the undoubted socialist objectives of the union, there, aren't, there isn't that much. I've counted 28 or articles in 28 issues in 44 years, and virtually all of those are before 1950. So the socialism kind of declines, peaks in the 1920s and 30s and declines after that. There's outrage at situations like the suicide of this woman, but the action is pretty benign. Basically, there's a belief that nationalisation of industry will cure all ills. So, the review is undoubtedly a Labor Party mouthpiece, by far the largest number of articles of, of a category of article uh, relate to the Labor Party. There are some issues around election times which are totally devoted to support for the ALP and it covers, it carries articles um, by um, leading Labor figures like the Premier Bill McKell and um, Dr Evatt, who was leader of the opposition in, in the federal parliament. Um, however, there's a consequence of this um, and there's an assessment by Catholic Action, which is an organisation that was set up to, uh, in their view, uh, oppose the communist influence in the Labor Party and the trade union movement. And their assessment of this union is it's communist control and there's a communist stranglehold. Now, what Catholic Action describes as communist and what is communist is open to debate. Um, if by communist we mean members of the Communist Party of Australia, which is what um, the Menzies government tried to ban, uh, then that makes sense since the Communist Party is in favour of revolution or overthrow of government and uh, at the time has allegiance to a foreign power in, in the form of the Soviet Union. So the, there are a number of articles in in the review that relate to communism. There's a report on the death of Lenin. 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 Um, this Russian reconstruction article is actually saying, well, you can lend some money to the Russians and you get paid 5% on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a number of other articles, but not a huge number, I must say, not, uh, not in comparison to say on the Labor Party. There is, in the 1930s, quite a lot about how wonderful conditions are in Russia. Uh, uh, but I, I suspect that that's, um, well, wishful thinking, perhaps. So my assessment is that it's not communist control. Uh, I see no evidence for communist support for uh, parliamentary candidates. There's overwhelming support for the ALP, 
Um, clearly, the, the union believes that there will be change through democratic means via the ALP. Uh, there's no cause for overthrow of the government. There's outright denial that anybody is a member of the Communist Party. And even things like the death of Lenin uh, gets less space. Virtually every issue contains a number of obituaries. And Lenin's obituary, by comparison, is one of the shorter ones. So I think my assessment is that it's socialist in the way the British Labour Party was in the 1940s when uh, the health system and the coal mines and the railways were nationalised and it believes um, in more or less the same set of values. Well, this is the graph that we saw before and there's another, there had a peak in there and it's declining and it's declining for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, it ceased to be by the 1930s the only medium with introducing introduction of radio, television in the 1950s. Uh, in fact, today, I believe most printing is printing of packaging. So the motto of the union is the, the art that preserves arts has come to an end because I suppose it's preserving packets of chips. There's also emerges in the, the 1950s um, what the review refers to as automation. But there's a sort of strange thing about it. Uh, you get the sense reading articles about new technologies that there's an excitement there. It's you know, a bit like more. Oh, and somebody's got a new car, well, here's a new printing printing press or whatever. Um, there's a belief that this new technology will result in safer working conditions. Uh, it will be more important. In fact, it is the introduction of new and more efficient machinery is used as an argument for reduction in working hours in the 1940s. But there is this growing sense that there's a revolution going on in the printing industry. Uh, possibly the end of some crafts and some technologies like letterpress. And letterpress, after all, is the technology of Gutenberg, uh, which is, as far as I can understand, all but, all but over. And of course, now I've said it's um, printing is competing with other things, well, radio and te television in the 1950s and 60s, and a lot of other things now. So, the end of the review. So the right hand side shows you the masthead after the 1960s. The union has spent a lot of money. It's had Harry Seidler design itself a, a purpose-built building in Regent Street, which has since been demolished. The, the aspirational mottos have gone. Um, and in, in a sense, the review has uh, moved away from that um, aspirational sense. And I guess this is one of the reasons why it is able to merge with the, uh, the dreaded PIEU and form as they did the PICO, P Printing and Kindred Industries Union, which later merged into um, I'm sorry, another, another union, and, and essentially disappeared. So that is the end of my presentation. And thanks very much uh, uh, yeah. for sharing, and uh, everyone, uh, thank you, Ian, for that presentation. That was great. Okay, thank you. Um, questions and comments? Um, I'll, I'll lead off just with one. I mean, um, it's obviously towards the latter period that you're talking about, but I, it, with that question of um, attitudes to the ALP and communism and, and your mention of uh, Doc Evert, uh, what, was the, what was the review's position during the Labor split? Oh, they were definitely in favour of Evert. Um, 
they are vehemently opposed to the groupers. That's that's the industrial groups, which are the uh, the thing that the right wing of the Labor Party sets up and which are controlled by Santa Maria's um, movement. Um, yeah, they they're definitely on the Everett side. Uh, there are articles, in fact, uh, it, it, by Everett in the review, presumably mass produced for um, consumption. But yeah, they're definitely on the on the Everett side. Uh, they're also, I have to say, in the 1930s, vehemently anti-fascist. Um, I didn't didn't go into the into the attitudes of the war, but you know the prediction of a coming war in about 19. 33. So there's some prescience there. Um, further questions or comments? Yeah, Ellen? Um, this isn't really into your presentation because I actually work at a printer. Oh, um, yes? There's definitely a tr the atmosphere of a dying industry every time you go into work. Oh. Just wondering your thoughts on that, if you agree or if you see any kind of future in maybe like these, um, I'll call them resistance groups very loosely, but unions or any kind of protest movement. Sorry, I didn't, which, which resistance, sorry, I didn't quite understand that. The resistance group, but in the sense of any sort of um, organised opposition, so it could be a union, could be... <sighs> I have to play play ignorant. I stopped in 1966. So, uh, what is happening today? And I'm not really don't have much expertise in 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 uh, in printing. You will know more about it than me. Uh, so I can't answer that. All I know is that um, um, my impression is that um, there's a vast amount of um, specialist printing processes for printing you know, flexible packaging and and boxes and things like that. And the actual printing of, well, as we know, the newspapers have more or less died, uh, but the printing of, of books and things like that is not being done in, in the way that it was in this era. So this is kind of the, the, the union and, and the, the review sort of follow the peak of, of printing as a technology, I think. Okay, if there's no, oh, yeah, Bill. Um, uh, I'm interested in your story uh, because I follow a sort of parallel story in the United States of America. And there was a man called Holderman Julius who printed little blue books, uh, these. They yeah. fit in your coat pocket. Uh, 500 million of them, roughly. And they were made, enabled by the technology of user, he bought a printing press for papers, newspapers, and turned out socialist booklets, 2000 different titles, uh, and they're called Little Blue Books. Mm -hmm. So they were successful till somewhere about the 1950s, and the last one uh, was burnt uh, in a Accidental fire in 1971, I think. So it's another finished story, but um, I collect the books and uh, I've got several thousand of them. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not exactly a question, but it's a, a parallel story to yours, I think. Thank you. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, Ian, thank you. I, I was interested in the attitudes towards the changes in technology um, that you referenced that there didn't seem to be much objection. And I wondered if there was any documentation around loss of skill or uh, in the industry and that loss of craft um, and any resistance at all or from what you said there wasn't. Well, this is the thing that I was quite surprised at. There you know, every few issues, there'd be, there'd be something about some new piece of machinery or some new technology. And it's just presented as a bit of neutral news. And it's really only till the 1950s. 
when I gather there is a genuine general um, apprehension in the union movement about the effects of automation, as they call it, uh, when uh, the concern rises. But even then, um, the editor, who was also the president of the union in about 1960, writes a quite glowing report on a printing exhibition that's been conducted in, in Sydney. And, you know, looking forward to the introduction of this new machinery and how it will um, how it will change these old, so I'd say, you know, 19th century printing works into modern printing operations. So no, there's a, there, this is a sort of a strange thing. It just my impression is it just crept up on them, and then it's too late. There's all this concentration on social ills and socialism and so on, and they missed the ball. Didn't keep their eye on the ball, whatever the expression is. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, I think we'll move on to our. Um, sorry. Yep. We'll move on to our next speaker now. Um, we've heard of the interplay of uh, material and social practices, continuing that journey towards social practices. We've got uh, Ellen McClendon. Uh, Ellen is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne, working on personal identity in Hull and Leipzig around uh, 1700. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Ellen. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay like this, or would your fans be better? Yeah. All good? Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I am looking at the University of Hala. Um, I'm, I've, presented, I've prepared a presentation which I'm just going to read out um, because I write much better than I speak. So if at any point I just race too much ahead, feel free to jump in and slow me down. And let me share my screen. Let's put some slides. That's shown up okay? Yep, yeah. okay. So that is the University of Halle uh, in northeastern Germany, which was the territory of the Elector of Brandenburg when it was established. I've got a map, present day Germany, just to give you an idea if that helps to have in your mind where it is exactly. Um, so, this, the Elector of Brandenburg, when it was found in 1694, was Friedrich III, later to become Friedrich of Prussia. It had earlier been within the Archbishopric of Magdeburg, which you can see there. However, when its administrator died in 1680, this territory was ceded to the House of Brandenburg as set out in the Peace of Westphalia. The Archbishop had moved the court from Halle already in the mid 16th century, which was something of a blow. And like many regions in early modern Germany, the town suffered greatly through the 30 years war one of its primary industries being the saline, with a history of salt harvesting dating back to the Bronze Age. Uh, following the war, production was 20% of its pre-war levels and it never really recovered from this flow. So a university is attractive for many reasons, not least as a remedy for these losses. The decision to establish a Lutheran university was also a measure to compensate for the excess of reformed universities and avoid losing young Lutheran theologians to foreign institutions. A foreign being neighbouring states were still German but separate uh, political powers. Indeed, while the elector had been successful brokering peace between Lutheran and Reformed churches, with a territory that was still reeling socially and economically from warfare 40 years on, he was on the whole more eager to attract influential individuals within its borders than to exert the stringent confessional demands so common in Europe at this time. It is perhaps not surprising then that the University of Halle became a magnet for rousing and provocative figures famous then as it is now for the many controversies that it hosted. Uh, conflict, of course, continued to permeate early modern life in Germany after the conclusion of the Thirty Years' War. Sorry, in German lands, it's not technically German at this point. Um, however, the discourse surrounding it evolved, scholars argued vocally for the necessity of debate. There are three figures stationed in Halle at different points in their career that I want to focus on to this end, probably the three best known at the university during this period. That was, that's the elector, just to give you some visuals. Um, this is a contemporary map on the left, a little X where Halle is, and then on the right, just to show you the territorial changes. And I'll leave it on this one with the three figures um, I've just mentioned now. So 
Christian Wolf, Christian Tomasius, and August Hermann Franke all lectured at the University of Halle in mathematics, philosophy, and theology, respectively. While all were also caught up in the philosophical and metaphysical debates of the time, Wolf is best known for his contributions into the development of German philosophy, Tomasius as a lawyer and educational innovator, and Franke for his pietistic charities. The dichotomous examples of Wolf and Franke in particular seem polar opposites in their attitudes. Franke fueled by brotherly fraternity, Christian charity, and constant self-reflection against Wolf on the path to frame and with an international gaze, relying on contacts professionally and focused very much in public and in private on his professional pursuits. However, both men were at some point forcibly removed from the state they were resident in, after causing philosophical uproar. Wolf and Tomasius had a lasting influence on education in both Halle and wider Germany, promoting the use of German for instruction instead of the customary Latin, and campaigning for the security to philosophize over contentious matters. Tomasius paid particular attention to the different duties of citizens and kings, arguing that in order for scholars to effectively contribute to their state, they must be allowed to practice academically without fear of reprisal from their authorities. It was generally accepted among scholars that any stable society required the gifts of philosophers. They could not adequately perform their role, however, if they felt stymied by authority, and so Tomasius contended that, a different, that different social roles required different relations. The king could naturally expect the respect and loyalty of his subjects, however, on philosophical matters, he ought to defer to the authority of philosophers. Ideas of individual ability in the Protestant lands, especially following the fracturing of the Roman Church in Europe. Oh, sorry, missed a word there. Ideas of individual ability advanced in Protestant lands, especially following the fracturing of the Roman Church in Europe. Growing certainty of the command individuals held in their word, world encouraged a heightened sense of responsibility, not merely the course of their own life, but also the society they dwelt within. Individual action consequently became a matter of social significance, and expectations from community and state evolved accordingly informed in part by changing understandings of human agency and ability. German-speaking lands had a particular interest in civic duty, as the numerous states made efforts to consolidate their power and independence at the conclusion of the Thirty Years' War. This brought the opportunity to transfigure one's role in society, not least philosophers who seemed continually to be at the forefront of societal change, whether they led it or simply placed themselves there. Tomasius, for instance, gained the favour of the Elector of Brandenburg while teaching in Leipzig, and he defended the marriage of the elector's half-sister, who was reformed, to the Lutheran Duke of Saxon site. So I've got an image of here. Now, Leipzig theologians had obliquely expressed their disapproval and sought repercussions for Tomasius' heresy. Rather than retaliate, Tomasius accepted the conditions imposed upon him and then left the state, securing an audience with the elector in Berlin and gaining permission to settle in Halle, continue his Leipzig lectures and receive a salary. Um, I'm not sure I mentioned it earlier on the map, but Leipzig and Halle are actually very close, I think. I've got the exact distance, I think it's about 20 kilometres, so it seems like a quite a wrench moving interstate, but um, geographically it wasn't actually that far at all. Uh, the university whose preparations were already sometime underway would be found within the next five years, and Tomasius would find himself the central figure in the new institution. For an individual to demonstrate the capacity for holding high office and nurturing these emerging political powers, it was necessary to exhibit proper conduct. The rules of etiquette and propriety in bygone eras have been well remarked by historians and are a notable feature of European societies before and after the early modern period. There was a shift across the 17th century, however, where what had once been considered the Christian virtue of courtesy, a moral good that indicated an upright character, became instead the social duty of civility, something that was consciously exhibited in order to contribute to the society an individual lived within. Conduct books and diaries proliferated as comportment became not merely a marker of virtue, but a social system that ensured that the welfare of the collective was maintained through the conduct of the individual. As the pursuit of knowledge formed its own identity and gave currency to the persons of philosopher, wider circumstances reinforced the pertinence of statehood and duty of the individual to society. Much has been made of the social code that scientific pioneers operated within during the early modern period. However, it's important to observe that this emerged against the wider trend towards the use of etiquette as a social regulator. There's an observable tension between the professed aim to avoid conflict and the quest for an accepted authority in philosophy, a field of preference, social credit and esteem over smooth relations. A clear example is the controversy that erupted between Christian Wolff and the Haller theologians, sparked by Wolff's vocal admiration for the philosophical yet heretical governance in China, which was presented in this um, speech he gave in Haller. His defence against the Halle theologians lays out grand polemics against dispute in philosophy, yet he brooks no argument against his own rationale in so doing. 
Indeed, it seems that the prospect of conflict was significantly less alarming to early modern thinkers than the prospect of disorder. Much of the ink expended by philosophers justifying the discordant nature of their craft highlighted the dispute in the hands of those who were driven by the desire for truth was no more than an avenue by which to meet one another's ideas. In the right hands, therefore, such discord was no threat to social order, the consequences of which manifested in, had manifested in several ways over the previous century. The prominence of local authority is evident in Haller, as the elector was a key figure in the scholastic controversies that reigned at the university. When Wolf drew outrage from the pietist theologians, it was directly to the elector they applied, succeeding in their mission to bring action against him and probably overshooting the mark when he was ejected from the state in 1724 with 48 hours notice before the threat of execution became a reality. Though it was Wolf's apparent atheism that had provoked the pietists as mentioned, the offence that they highlighted for the elector was the threat that his ideas harboured for the authority of the sovereign, and it was this that ultimately provoked Friedrich of Brandenburg to action. This local influence was apparently stronger in German lands than elsewhere, as Laurentius, or Laurentius Blumentros, physician to the Russian Tsar, persuaded Wolf when answering his concerns regarding the Russian clergy in St. Petersburg, the city in which he was considering a professional appointment. Blumentrost wrote in April 1724 to assuage Wolf that there was little to fear from the Russian clergy, as the Russian emperor was effectively the highest appointment in the church. Authority and political legitimacy were understandably, therefore, a matter of great concern for both sovereigns and citizens. Arguments as to who should be given political voice consider the primary determinant that was devotion to truth, which disqualified anyone who was bound and therefore devoted to others, essentially anyone who wasn't of the no nobility. The, ideal temp the template of the ideal individual to be, to be trusted with knowledge thus developed around the drive for truth and reason, two key concerns of early modern scholars. This is, this is witnessed in the, sorry, I'm just going to drink water, <laughs> I'm about to lose my voice. Um, this is witnessed in the arguments bandied between Wolf and the Pietists, as well as in Tomasius' practical philosophy forever turned towards the betterment of society. Changing power balances brought also change and often conflicting ties of kinship, loyalties, and loyalties that may once have been ensured by familial or community ties became murkier as power and authority consolidated ever more potently about the figure of the sovereign. This is not to say there was a total restructure of power structures in German lands following this conflict, but rather that the drive to establish authority within sovereign states gained momentum, and concerns about matters of duty, loyalty, and authority gained prominence in public discourse. The new ideal of what a philosopher should be, including a community bonded by kindred rhymes, transgressed in many respects traditional ties of loyalty in society to family and community. It is perhaps not surprising then that the nature of friendship was also a topic of great interest to early modern thinkers. Understandings on this matter seem to tend towards a stark opposition. While some consider that true friendship was possible only between people on an even footing of both mind and social rank, others considered it was necessary for those involved to occupy entirely separate social strata. The only one interest in the passions was threaded within this, as there was some concern that the warm feeling attendant on a friendship may cloud clear judgment in matters of philosophical integrity. Indeed, weak control of the affection was the key weapon deployed in the strife between Wolf and the pietists Franz Buda and Joachim Lunger, who were the um, main adversaries in the uh, conflict mentioned earlier. Both parties accusing the other of allowing their emotions to guide their behaviour, the antith antithesis of good scholarship. Buda's champion Georg Volk declared that Volk had been led by his effect in into delusion, satisfied merely to please a few and ideally harm Buda's reputation in the process. Volk for his part echoes this sentiment, urging arguing that passions distort perceptions so that people fail to see the error in those they consider friends. It seems that Wolf's line, echoed by many of his antagonists in Haller at this time, is that good relations are not to be elevated above good management, which invites the question as to whether scholars perceived a potential license to disregard social convention where it interfered with free debate. Christian Tomasius, for instance, pointed to the verbose and pleasant sounding, yet also sophisticated, pompous, quarrelsome, impassioned way of teaching employed by learned pagans under Constantine in Rome. While these errors ought to have been set down in a gentle, clear and simple way, they were allowed to proliferate to the point that soon the pagans were attributed false opinions that had never entered their heads, followed by wrathful and vehement refutation of these chimeras. In the place of reasonable refutation, a rhetoric of exclamations, questions, objections or learned invective was employed, which did not advance the matter. Soon doubt was no longer answered at all. Just quoted from his essays there on the slide. Rather than reason the debate, what took place was polemic with the goal of, provide, of proving which party was the sturdier in their virtue, leading not to harmony, but confusion and resentment. 
If you recall that Tomasi is considered a social hierarchy only worth defending insofar as it supported civic harmony, he seems to be an appeal for a license to be discourteous if doing so allowed one to be a good citizen. Within Tomasi's argument is the solution to the confusion regarding relations across social classes, with the pursuit of truth again the justifying cause of Trump's even divine monarchy. He suggests that in some instances it is necessary to forego traditional structures for the sake of promoting a greater ideal. Sovereign authorities, therefore, when engaged in philosophical debate, become just another philosopher subject to the same measure of legitimacy as men like Tomasius himself. In terms of friendship, social standing was both important and somewhat malleable. There was uncertainty during this period as to whether friendship between peers was hindered by conflict due to the natural rivalry, something that was mitigated when friendship occurred across classes, where the social stooping of the higher ranked person marked true altruism. Possibly a crystallising distinction between public and private also brought a new understanding of friendship as a source of comfort and companionship apart from daily life, and therefore lacking the self-interest that was attached in previous eras. At that time, Wolf was contending with the Halopietists. At the time, sorry, that Wolf was contending with the Halopietists. There are two identifiable understandings of friendship. One considered it a refuge from the world, and the other as an investment to assist in social mobility. By the mid-18th century, this seems to have jaded in some thinkers who consider friendship a more calculated move. In truth, early modern thinkers seem as uncertain about friendship as we are about their thoughts in the matter. It does seem clear, however, that a friendship was understood to involve some correlation in spirit or temperament, and therefore could be expected to transcend the bounds within which it was born, whether professional, geographical, etc. If I apply this to Wolf and the Halopietists, it is difficult to forecast where alliances, both professional and friendly, will form. Certainly, there was a great degree of shared sentiment and philosophy, and while discussions of controversy in and about Halop frequently featured the Pietists, as one of two opposing sides. Such simplistic portraiture seems to leave no room to pursue the sympathies that antagonistic parties in Halle have with one another. Certainly as groups concern themselves with the state of education, there is already strong cause for some level of connection between the two, whether the reason for the conflict or something that speaks of unity at the heart of this division. Both Franca and even Tomasius had all been expelled from states and installed elsewhere effectively as philosophical refugees. All wrote prolifically in defense of academic freedom, and the importance of reason, either in publications or private letters. And even in dispute, as shown above between Wolf and the local theologians, the arguments run along very similar lines. The nature of the crime was not a point of contention, merely who had committed it. Wolf's eventual eviction from Halle due to a murky stance regarding natural versus divine law was a culmination of the controversy that brought even Tomasius against him, despite their shared philosophies in many respects. It's a slide I just put together just before the presentation, so it's not particularly polished, but um, just to show you all the parties I'm speaking about together and roughly their perhaps alliances, so that that's not, not something I would set in concrete. Um, the affiliations between Halle scholars was complex, and it is difficult to define any one scholar in terms of their, in terms of their association with a particular philosophy. Even when discussing the Wolfian controversy with the Pietists, it must be noted that Tomasius was significantly Pietistic himself, despite sharing an affinity with many of Wolf's views. In a publication defending against the criticisms, criticisms of Lunger and Buddha, Wolf suggests that impartiality, whether through friendship or social hierarchy, is a scholarly pollutant. His calls for impartiality were embedded within arguments highlighting the error of Buddha's own argument, with the insinuation that reliance on reason, that is impartiality, rather than appeal to authority that is partiality, necessitated being inclined towards false own position. Conflict, moreover, cannot be avoided as to remain impartial is to exist in a dichotomy. Wolf's written output is concerned mostly with advancing his own philosophical views or adding to the defense of academic disputes founded upon reason. Even in his private correspondence, these concerns dominate. Letters are very business oriented and the only real glimpse into Wolf's day to day is when he discusses theoretical travel plans and the anxieties he has for his wife and children regarding this. In an exchange at Blumentrost in 1724, Wolf accuses Franco of writing calumnium to the Russian bishops and therefore blackening his character there. Sorry, calumnium is a German word, um, it's calumny. Um, the strain of the conflict has passed on to his family, which prevents him from traveling to Russia. So it's Blumentrost on the right in the Frankish Stift I'm about to talk about from Franca's side, as Franca's output by comparison is considerably more local in character. His chief concern was the operation of Pietist institutions, which is the Stiftungen in Halle, a task that saturated his writing, whether in its content or in its sentiment. 
Regardless of the matter that he discusses, his pietist attitude is ever present, often in tone and sometimes explicitly. So he writes frequently, but despite his difficulties, he does not wish to be drawn into uncharitable speech by his frustrations with others around him. Rucker certainly gives a greater impression of being a community figure, concerned more about the presence of conflict than the issue under contention. Perhaps this indicates his geographical anchor in the orphanage, while Wolf was more mentally nomadic. Though some of historians claim Franca deliberately sought controversy as a means to bolster his own position, he enjoyed a particular fraternity in Halle as a member of the pietist community. While he had a frosty reception from the clergy there initially, who perceived him as a threat to their authority, as a proponent of pietism, he was immersed in a community who shared a common struggle against most other religious outlooks in the region. Franca, in fact, and likely many other pietists, welcomed struggle, which he called Buskamp, as an aid to the development of the soul. Kelly J. Whitmer, a historian who's written a lot on um, Franca's uh, charitable institutions in Halle, highlights that Franca, that while, uh, sorry, highlights that Franca was reluctant to denounce Wolf, intending the few public words he did offer against him to be a reproach rather than a denunciation, and done only at the urging of his friend Joachim Munger. This Buskamp, however, did not translate into open warfare with any and every other religion. In a letter to Joanna Margaret Retta Linka in 1690, a connection of the Frankische Stiftungen, Franke provides commentary on the unexpected welcome he received from Catholics in Erfurt, including funding from the city governor. The Catholics, attracted by the, this is a quote, pleasure in practicing true godliness with seriousness, that's the end of the quote, provided support for Franke's efforts, including funding from the city governor. Considering this unlikely alliance as a blessing, Franke was evidently envisaged by his ability to influence across confessions. While the divergence between their respective doctrines was not forgotten, Franca reports his approach was one of gentleness and cunning, likely echoing Matthew's gospel and so apprehending the greater likelihood of conversion through such an approach. Wolf perhaps better represents the newly minted professional scholar suspended in a network connected as much by kindred thought as geographical proximity. Engaged at Halle as a professor in mathematics, Wolf built up a following of dedicated students and ventured eventually into the field of philosophy. While it was this that provoked the ire of Halle's theologians and incurred his expulsion from the state, it also greatly boosted his fame and he was eventually invited to return after a stint in Marburg, in considerably better shape professionally and financially than when he had left in 1724. The controversy that drew his banishment was not confined to the community of thinkers at Halle, moreover, and gained notoriety for numerous reasons. In Wolf's own writings, a shared identity with notable figures across Europe and the allusion to a martyrdom for science, if not pinned to his label, certainly lurks behind his words. After moving away from Halle and mixing with more international scholars, Wolf also wrote ever more in Latin, despite his earlier crusade for the greater use of German. To finish, a brief comparison of Wolf and Franke's attitude to money might prove useful, but this was a topic of concern for both, and indeed most scholars during this period. Wolf's letters discussed money often in the same business tone that colours most of his correspondence. The chief point is salary, both whether another position is worth severing his steady income for, and the necessary figure to entice him to move. Amidst this is also commentary on various other costs regarding certain plans and items. Franca, by contrast, also speaks extensively on money, both as a necessity and a spiritual burden. A significant source of financial concern was the Frankische Stiftungen. However, when Franca relates this in his correspondence, it is a spiritual exercise to emphasize the wisdom of God's providence. Again, I think we can see here the different position and circumstances of these two philosophers. While Wolf is on the move, not entirely of his own volition, Franca is clearly settled and not obliged to balance an unforeseen budget. To bring things back to conflict before I close, these different understandings of friendship may suggest that conflict and controversy mean different things for both, and neither derided nor embraced wholesale. For Wolf, it seems a professional mechanism that could be either a foil or attack. For Franca, conflict was abhorred, but not if through it was possible the correction in a person's Christian formation. And that's that. Just a picture of Halla to leave you with. Thanks very much, everyone. Oh, me in. Thanking Ellen for that presentation. Um, thanks, that's great. Yeah, we'll just stop. Sorry, I'm still sharing. That's <laughs> right. um, very good, yeah. So um, questions and comments? Um, I'll lead off by so, um, what was uh, Wolf's position on friendship and um, family? Was, it, was that at all a virtue? Or was it even if it was corrosive to philosophy? I mean... Uh, well, I haven't come across any specific reference to it from actually anybody that I'm looking at. Um, but they, a lot of them seem to have specific people they often appealed to and 
sought advice from. So Wolf, he was speaking to Bloom and Tross um, in his, it's a published edition of his letters. It's just Bloom and Tross solidly for a little while as he's considering a position in Russia. And this could be a slightly um, false take because many of the letters that there was probably a lot of other stuff going on at the time, but this is all I've got as a record, but it just seems like a, outpouring of all his frustrations and suspicions towards Franca because I think he was in Halloween he's writing these letters um but also he'd been offered a professional position so it wasn't like it was just a mate he was writing to to vent he was also gauging whether or not he wanted to make the move um if it's worth it he spoke a lot about um well partly the travel the difficulties for his family but also the climate in Russia, he had strong concerns about whether they, that would be something he was willing to immerse himself in. Um, but yeah, he, friendship is not a explicit point. Um, emotion is definitely commented on a lot though, and they all had the same opinion like I mentioned in that. It's almost, it seems a little bit like an argument you might hear today in any kind of political or maybe academic argument where there's certain things that you just know you don't want to be accused of and being controlled by your affection was definitely one so um yeah he accuses the theologians of they've been controlled by their effect and after they've already accused him of being controlled by his and it seems to be almost that's a way to crumble his entire argument if you can persuade everyone that's true thanks um go ahead yeah um yeah thanks alan um following on on that uh idea about uh yes setting that Affect and emotion is something uh, you don't want to be accused of. The other thing you don't want to be accused of is being disloyal to your sovereign. So was, what I was wondering is whether at any stage there is something like an emotional aspect on loyalty that you would expect much later uh, to come indefinitely in the end of the 18th century is this kind of yeah, the love of the king, uh, to, to love the king and then uh, all of that. Or is this, uh, so is, uh, is this entirely, uh, then this kind of loyalty to the sovereign that plays entirely as, so as a thing that is rational or is it just a, a duty? Uh, or is, is there something attached that could be described as emotional in whatever sense? Um, yeah, Tomasius is my key source on that idea because he writes extensively on that topic. I think it's actually his main contribution to Haller at this time in um, historiography. For him, I would say it's very rational because he's making a clear argument about it. In that, you know, I can be a loyal sub I can be a loyal subject, sorry, while also criticizing things that might be uncomfortable to have criticized or stating things that might be um, not totally in line with the sovereign's opinions. Not that I'm certain there was any clear understanding of the sovereign's opinions on what was going on in Halle. However, he was the basically the buck stopped with the sovereign in probably most states. So it was almost like the boss, the CEO of the company. You might never see him or know anything about him, but you just know not to cause any friction there. And there's probably an understanding from people who are a bit closer to the sovereign of what that would be, as well as just societal understandings at the time. Um, for Franca, I could imagine definitely there being, uh, if he speaks on his connection to the sovereign at all, some very, maybe emotional, but more just less steeped in rationality because he's writing on uh, he, he writes a lot about his day-to-day -day operation and also just future plans for the Frankfurter Stiftung, but also um, when he writes about the conflicts he was in or just his movements towards other people, it's always got this very um, saturating pietistic tone, which is, yeah, everything is an opportunity and everything is to be done with the attitude of being pietistic. So I don't think he would have actually written about his views on the sovereign and loyalty, but I think if he did, it would again be informed by that view. Um, and Wolf, yeah, that's probably something that I've had to pursue because I haven't actually, I focused mostly on his controversy before he was ejected from Halle. Um, he was invited back in 1740, I said, I haven't read, read around that at all, but there's a chance maybe there's, 
I would assume just from what I've read about him have been almost a, I don't know, told you so attitude, but um, yeah, emotion and loyalty to the sovereign is, I'm not sure. I think I would have to read around that and be very aware of that question because I don't think it will come through clearly. I think the, the um, focus on rationality was quite long lived as well. So it would have to be made in a way that you could definitely meld the two together. Yeah, I know. Uh, but uh, and one, one thing that I thought of that might be at the back of it entirely that you could see this kind of germs of which is basically then the Prussian public servant emerging here. Yeah. It's, it's just my duty. I have to fulfill that and uh, that's everything. Yeah, definitely from Tamasius, it's all about serving the state. And I don't know how much that also was informed by the fact that they knew that was expected because states were emerging. But um, yeah, it's, you could sum Tamasius as what I've read of him, sum his um, ethic up in just how to be a good citizen and also speak your mind if possible. Thanks, Alan. Um, so we'll move on to our um, fourth and final speaker for this session, um, Bill Palmer. Um, Bill's got a BSc, a teacher certificate, uh, two, MSCs, two, MSC, two MSCs and a PhD, and he's worked in Britain, Nigeria, Papua New Guinea, Western Samoa, Tanzania and Australia. Uh, so it's fair to say he's been around. Um, it, Bill was a senior lecturer in science education at Charles Darwin University from 1989 to 2007, when he retired after nearly 50 years in science education. His research in chemical education and the history of science continues as an adjunct research associate at Curtin University. And um, Bill will be talking to us today on, uh, you know, perhaps the most material of science is uh, some chemistry stories. I'll try and uh, put this on. I first share. Is anything coming up? Uh, not yet. You'll need to select the screen that you're sharing and then. Uh, I'm not sure where I've gone wrong, but there's a, my thing is up there and there's a thing share, which I'm doing, and it tells me to go to OneDrive, which is not right. When you, when you hit the share screen button, normally a window should come up, which then you have to select which screen you're, or window you're sharing. Oh, okay. PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. That sounds like what you want. <laughs> and then and you need to select it and hit OK. Yeah. Okay. Select it and then hit the share button. No, that comes back again to that. From, and it's a message send to. It's come up. Uh, I think I'm stuck. The PowerPoint is just running on your local computer, is it? It's on my computer, yes. Yeah. And so when you hit the share screen button, do you see that window with the option of the PowerPoint? The option comes out as OneDrive personal. Well, you don't want to share that. Um, you uh, it, find... it comes to PowerPoint presentation and yeah. PDF, attach so... copy instead. Perhaps if I restart this, 
it's been there all the time. I'll try restarting. I'll show share my screen. Oh, and oh, now that's not going to work. If you want to email me the PowerPoint, I can always uh, run it for you as well. Okay. And your email is martin.bush. You should have <laughs> martin.bush yeah, at unimail.edu. Let's just try this. PowerPoint's coming up again now. Share. No, same thing. Try one other thing. Still the same. Still. I've tried three you. times doing that. That's the same thing. I, I reckon you can find your email address next. Yeah, I think that's probably best. It's been sent to you now. Okay, great. Um, our text board does note that you should to share the screen, you need to use the green share screen button in the Zoom window, not the share screen in the PowerPoint window. Oh, right, is that what I'm doing wrong? Yeah. But I do have your PowerPoint now, so I'm happy to. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, excellent. Um, oh, so I was sharing screen, but yeah. Wrong screen. Yeah. Uh, that can be confusing. Uh, okay, you can just feel free to start your PowerPoint and get into it. Right. Okay. And so, slideshow. Is that the? That's not the full thing on. Yeah. Slideshow. Oh. From beginning. Okay. Uh, sorry, everyone, about that. Um, my paper is on five early Scottish chemists, stories of adventurers and entrepreneurs. 
and I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I work and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Uh, so the first, uh, what the paper is about. Uh, I'm sorry to have delayed it because it was very full at any rate. Uh, it's about five Scottish chemists, Archibald Cochrane, Charles McIntosh, John McLean, David Boswell Reed, and James uh, James Young. Uh, I've chosen five, but I could have chosen many more from this because this is a very rich period in chemistry in Scotland. And I personally have no connection with Scotland. I know no ancestor of mine that's Scots. So uh, it's just that it's very good chemistry and some good stories. And so the first story is about Archibald Cochrane. Uh, and I'm going to um, just read bits of this. Uh, the trouble is at the moment, half my screen is taken up by, uh, I think we can do it there, right, okay. Um, so he was born in 1848, so this is a very early part of um, chemistry in Scotland. He was uh, put into the uh, Navy by his father, but he decided he didn't like sailing and decided he wanted to go into the army, which he did. But while sailing, he noticed that uh, sailing vessels got uh, attacked by various sea insects and uh, bored into the holes and the sh ship soon started rotting. And this made him think that coal tar might prevent the ships from rotting. Uh, well, he then joined the army and seemed to have enjoyed army life. His father died in 1778. So Archibald then became the ninth Earl of Dundonald. And he was, he was left the estate, but the estate was mortgaged up to the hilt. So he had no money. He had a nice title. And his education was limited. I've never really found where he actually obtained his knowledge of chemistry. But his knowledge of chemistry is considerable. He had married in, uh, earlier and had children. And uh, he started uh, to uh, create this works at his home in Kinross. And his interest in chemistry seems to have come from his mother. Uh, and his wife loaned him 10,000 pounds to start. And so he started his business at Yarkham. Uh, he took on uh, Joseph Black, who was a good chemist uh, and whose judgment can be uh, relied on. I think we can't re all rely on Archibald Cochrane's judgment all that well, because you get very enthused by things. And we also find it difficult to. Um, uh, we also find it difficult to accept his son's opinion of him later on um, because they have, seem to have permanent family quarrels. Um, so often we find that information is contradictory. So he starts his tar company. Um, but his tar company depends really on the idea that the British Admiralty will change the way in which they're 
protecting their vessels to using his uh, tar from putting copper on the bottoms of their ships. But the world is corrupt and uh, there are a lot of people who have an interest in putting copper on the bottom of ships and therefore don't like the idea of tarring, which is very much cheaper. And so uh, he could never get the full amount of money that he wanted from uh, the Admiralty because they simply waited until his patent had run out and then did it, the tarring for free. His first wife died and he remarried later. His manufacturing company, people joined him on and uh, they, one of the partners was sent off to Paris to improve uh, their chemical knowledge. And he, the company is actually making money at this stage, but unfortunately, he's not getting any of it. And he's also spending lots of money because he's always enthusiastic about it. Uh, the coal tower industry was eventually assisted by the main byproduct coke being used as a fuel in steel production. And so he starts to make a little bit of money. He puts forward, uh, he writes on agriculture as well. He uh, does, he's quite innovative, but he still can't make money. His son has been a, a court martial in the Navy. Uh, an extraordinarily brave man, but you wouldn't say that he was exactly sensible and spends a lot of his time quarreling. Uh, but his, he looks after his elderly father and the junction between them you'll see here in red that the Lord Cochrane is, upon his beloved behaved in the most outrageous and cruel manner to his father, the Earl of Dundonald, knocking him down five pair of stone stairs, dragging him by the collar through a long stone passage and wounding him in a severe manner and taking in his boy, employ Thomas Newman, who had nearly murdered him. So then Donald lived in poverty for many years in Paris. Uh, but why he did so is difficult to understand because he left 15,000 pounds divided between his nieces and nephews. And it's a fortune. Uh, so, so there wasn't really any need for him to live in poverty. So that's the story of Dundonald. Now, a quieter personality, Charles Macintosh, and Macintosh, as we know, is famed for Macintosh's, the waterproof raincoat. He had uh, a happier life. His uh, father was a manufacturer and made dyes from cud beer, which is made from uh, the Highland uh, heather. He went to grammar school in uh, Glasgow and was interested in chemistry. He was friendly with uh, uh, John McLean, who we'll talk about later. He uh, met, uh, he attended lectures of Doc Dr. Joseph Black, and before his 20th birthday, he started to manufacture salmoniac and increased his range of products by manufacturing lead and aluminium acetates. He married and became interested in dyeing fabrics, including making Prussian blue. So uh, he bleached cloth, but he found that uh, bleaching cloth was 
originally by soaking the cloth in urine and leaving it for some months, which wasn't entirely an efficient process. He found a way of adding lime to it that uh, meant that he could uh, join uh, with Charles Tennant and uh, Tennant, Knox and Co built a large factory to produce sulfuric acid, lime, chloride of lime, soda, soap and other chemicals. The process of destructive distillation of coal uh, um, continued. Macintosh pur purchased tar and ammonia residues from Glasgow Gas Works and experimented with natural rubber. He found that naphtha dissolved it and made him a waterproof cloth for which he's famed. Uh, he had uh, a, a good partnership with Thomas Hancock and uh, set up big factories for producing this cloth. Uh, Macintosh died in 1843. John McLean um, uh, was born in 1771. Good friend to uh, his parents died, and he was a good friend to um, uh, Charles Macintosh, and the father looked after Maclean as a stepson. He was interested in uh, chemistry, produced uh, papers, was a student on various aspects of chemistry, and uh, traveled to Edinburgh, London, and Paris. What's important is that he, in Paris, he met important people there and took up uh, the uh, position of Lavoisier, which was anti, uh, anti -fugistron. Uh So, uh, he found that revolutionary France appealed to him. He enter entertained views on the comparative merits of the monarchical and republican forms of government, which have eventually led him to emigrate to the United States. The motto was, where there is liberty, there is my country. And it's interesting to see that he, he sees liberty for himself, but he doesn't necessarily see that, that as transferring his liberty to others. He goes to the United States, settles down uh, at the uh, University uh, Princeton, and uh, has children there. His fame comes from uh, Priestley had come to America and was writing Trying to, uh, trying to claim that the Fugistron theory was valid, and McLean attacked Priestley, and he attacked his experimental skill, and he says that his theory was complicated, contradictory, and inadequate. He was so rude that he annoyed Priestley, and they spent some years quarreling uh, in the papers. But he had, was reputa gaining a reputation at Princeton, and Benjamin Silliman, the famous American scientist, um, gives credit, credit to Maclean for much of his early knowledge of chemistry, and they uh, form a close friendship. Uh, he's still working at uh, the U College of New Jersey now Princeton University, and a fire destroyed the main uh, place where they worked, Nassau Hall, and uh, the administration believes it's students that have broken the, that have burnt the place down, 
uh, whilst uh, uh, the students probably didn't do this, but they are very rebellious. And we find that uh, eventually they expelled 125 of their students uh, for rioting. Uh, this leads to divisions between the uh, board of trustees and the ma actual management, the professors and uh, Smith, who's the principal. And uh, the uh, board of trustees take over and appoint a new administration. McLean uh, resigns, takes up a new position uh, at the College of uh, Williamsburg in William and Mary in Williamsburg, and uh, is so ill that he can't continue, and he died on the seventeenth of February, eighteen fourteen. So um, I don't know how. Uh, I hope I can have a bit longer, so I will carry on. Uh, Dr. Peter Reed uh, studied medicine at Edinburgh. Uh, he uh, is interested in chemistry and he works for as a hired assistant to Thomas Charles Hope, who's one of um, uh, the, uh, he's Joseph Black's successor in Edinburgh. Uh, one of the most difficult of Hope's several assistants to manage was David Boswell Reed. Uh, Reed uh, was evidently a bad tempered man and uh, but very clever and he believed that practical chemistry was all important and so he would have sympathy from people nowadays. He started his own practical teaching classes and did them better than uh, his uh, uh, than hope. Uh, so he uh, has a, a, a small uh, school which teaches practical chemistry and he spends a lot of money on making it a huge laboratory that's better than the one at the university. He's always been interested in health all these um, academics had training as a doctor as well as chemistry. Chemistry is a subsidiary part and he's interested in community health and that uh, in, means that he introduced that in his laboratory he introduced small microchemical techniques that didn't get introduced till 100 years later anywhere else and he uh, then moves to England and works uh, for the House of Commons and has good designs for ventilating the House of Commons. And so he spends a lot of his time in considering problems of ventilation, heating, lighting and acoustics. The House of Commons liked his work and uh, considered that his skills, zeal and determination is uh, that the House of Commons is indebted to him for that. He was an unsuccessful candidate for a chemical chair, which was taken uh, by Thomas Graham, who we'll talk about later. And he gave a series of talks about uh, chemistry and daily life. He gets the job of um, uh, uh, designing the new uh, House of Commons um, ventilation systems, and they're pleased with that, but he quarrels with the architect and is eventually invited to give some lectures uh, at the Smithsonian Institute in the US. And he gets a job Sorry. 
and gets a job in the US. Uh, unfortunately, the job falls through and he becomes an army surgeon with the Union forces and is given the responsibility of inspector of military hospitals, but dies suddenly in 1863 at a young age. If you can try and get through your uh, last one in about two minutes, that would be great. Thanks, Phil. Uh, the most generous and pleasantest of the people I'm talking about is James Young. Uh, he's very poor um, and uh, he uh, attends Thomas Graham's lectures, works for Thomas Graham, and uh, eventually moves with him to London, then moves to set up an industry uh, with Tennant, Clow and Company, and uh, then starts a small works at Ardwick Bridge, and he starts making a lot of money from making, uh, uh, using uh, black oil shale in order to um, create paraffin. And it's the paraffin uh, used in lamps for lighting uh, that makes him money. And he's most successful. And later in his life, he looks after Thomas Young. Sorry, he looks after uh, the memory of Livingston and his family, David Livingston, the explorer. So, I'll now talk about the lives of the five chemists. The lives of these chemists lie in a period of rapid industrial expansion between 1750 and 1900. Joseph Black is influential on several of them. Cochrane, Macintosh and Young, involved in uh, chemical manufacturing, while the other two were uh, used their medical qualifications and as chemists. Cochrane and Young obtained their fortune from products of coal. Uh, it might have been expected that the two academics would have had the easiest life that they lived, uh, that they died youngest. The interesting comparison is that MacLean left Britain to obtain freedom for himself, but possessed slaves whilst in America. Well, Reed died serving as a doctor in the American Civil War on the Union side to free slaves. There's a certain um, uh, interest in that. Uh, the Interesting is that the earliest of them is titled. The three middle ones uh, uh, had well off parents, and it's only uh, in the 19th century that the youngest, that James Young, broke away out of working class poverty. So I think that's my stories for the moment. You can ask which of the chemist is most adventurous or which chemist is the most entrepreneurial. Thank you. And sorry for the rush towards the end. Oh, thank you. And um, yeah, well, join me in thanking uh, Bill for quite a really impressive amount of uh, biography there to get through. Um, so thanks for doing that. Are there any, um, we have got a bit over time for this session, but are there any questions or comments for Bill? Um, I'll just slip one in. Um, you mentioned the lecture um, on chemistry of daily life by um, David Boswell Reed. Uh, you slipped, skipped over that you also had a book or a pamphlet um, made of that title. Do you know how successful that was? Do you have any idea of? of Not that? really. Um, it, it was that interest in his life of uh, general uh, hygiene for the working classes that he, he, that influenced him. And I mean, I said that he was bad tempered and quarrelsome, but he did a lot of good things as well. And uh, including ventilating the House of Commons. Uh, so I don't 
really know about the success of that pamphlet. Okay, thanks. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Um, no, we might uh, draw this session to a close a bit over time. Uh, thank, can you join me in thanking all of the speakers, um, especially uh, um, Bill at the end there. Um, please do join us for the Dyson lecture that starts at 6 p.m. Um, on the webinar link. And um, there is a plenary that's already started from the um, ASLEC ANZ conference that we are um, joining with. So uh, that you did need to register on the link that was sent around earlier. But um, if you're interested, you could jump into that. But otherwise, please, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you at the Dyson at six. But thanks um, to all of our speakers for a um, for really quite interesting session. Um, see you again a bit later. Thank you. Thank you very much.